Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Those who know your name put their trust in you. You, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord, who declare God's deeds among all people. Knowing our great need, but trusting in God's love for us, let us confess together our sin. God of saving love, we confess the weakness of our faith. When danger lurks, we focus on the threat and fear, rather than trust in you, our hope. We call on you anxiously, not confidently. We forget your promised power.
who turn from sin and sorrow, to all who turn to God in hope, hear the good news of God's grace. We put this in trust of the forgiving love of God. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. <laughs> Please be seated, except for the children. I'd like to invite you all to come forward for your time with Mr. Danny. Shazam! Oh my goodness! This is the this is the most we've had at second service in a long time, and I'm in trouble because <laughs> I had a leave behind and. I think I'll share some next Sunday. <laughs> anyway, so let's see. What day did we just have? What was a special day? Valentine's Day. That's exactly right. And you know what? We've had a lot of rain, but guess what's coming soon? Christmas. Well, before Christmas. That's a great <laughs> I like the, I like the way you think. I like the way you think. So let's think about what happens when we get out of school. What happens then? Summer. Summer. Right, and you know what? We what happens then? We, we uh, maybe we get on a boat. Now, this is the best I could do. I know it doesn't look like a boat, but it belongs to one of my grandsons. So we'll just pretend it's a boat. So, how many have ever been on a boat? Raise your hand. Cool. So, what do you? You've been on a boat? No, you haven't. Well, it'll always be the first time. What do you do when you get on a boat? What do you normally do? Yes, ma'am. You ride, number one answer. What's that one? Oh, my goodness. Oh, you're stealing all my thunder. Put on a life jacket. That's the number one safety. Yes, ma'am. Oh, tubing. Very great. So when you get on a boat, sometimes you ride. Sometimes you jump off when it's not running. Sometimes you water ski when you get older. Or you tube. But the... Well, it's kind of hard to water ski. Um, <laughs> we'll answer that the next time I'm up. How's that? Because <laughs> I don't, I, I used to be able to, so you're kind of asking the wrong guy. Because, you know, this, this blonde hair it gets a little rough water skiing these days. But let's talk about life jackets. Life jacket is a number one thing. What else might you see on a boat? Yes, ma'am. Sunscreen. Oh, we got a healthy, smart crowd here. What happens, yeah, yeah, what happens if you run out of gas or maybe you're in a canoe? What do you have to use to, to make a canoe go? A paddle. What else, maybe? A whistle. Very good. Yes, ma'am. Snacks. <laughs> I love it. Snacks. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so. Let's, let's drop back so we know we got to wear a life jacket. And sometimes when you're like this summer and you want to go out, maybe your mom or dad gets on their phone and they look at the weather, that weather app. And, oh, it's going to be a great day. It's going to be <coughs> sunny, hot. Let's go get a suntan and wear sunscreen, take snacks, wear life jackets. Great. But sometimes a storm will approach. And a storm is wind waves, maybe sometimes rain and lightning from the sky. Yeah. 
So it's smart to be alert and get off the lake or the ocean if you think a storm's approaching. And don't be afraid to tell your mom and dad, let's get out of here and go to, go to shore safely. But what I want to tell you real quick, there's a story in the Bible about Jesus and his disciples. And they are, uh, it doesn't look quite like this boat, but they're on a boat and they're, they're crossing the, a, a water, a sea or a lake. And all of a sudden, it gets rough. Storm comes, wind's blowing, even water's starting to lap over into the boat. Now, this is early on in, in the disciples with Jesus, and they get nervous. And they're looking around like, this thing may swamp. We may be in trouble. What do they do? They find Jesus. Where is Jesus in the boat? Does anybody know? I know it's a tough question. Yes, ma'am. He is sleeping. Yes, he is sleeping in the back of the boat. And they go wake him up and they go, Sir, what are you doing sleeping? We're about to, we're about to swamp and maybe, I don't like to use the word drown, but maybe drown. And Jesus gets up and he goes over. He reaches out of the boat and he touches the water. And he says, Peace, be still. Waves stop, and the wind quits blowing, and the disciples are looking around like, they don't really know who Jesus is, and they said, who is this guy? I mean, we're in a fierce storm about to be swamped, and all of a sudden, it's just peaceful and cool. Well, that was one of the powers that Jesus had. In fact, that was kind of his second miracle. I think the first miracle, you know why he was sleeping, I think? He had just fed the 5,000, if you know that that, that parable or that story. And, you know, after feeding 5,000 people, you, we'd all probably be sleepy, wouldn't we? Anyway, he was just kind of taking a nap, maybe. I don't know. But anyway, so what the, the, the important part was, the miracle that he said, peace, be still, okay? So we want to remember that in every day. Sometimes when we get in a fight with our brother or somebody gets really sick, or somebody has an automobile accident, we kind of get sad, don't we? And so we just remember to say that saying, peace, be still, okay? And it just makes, it just makes you feel really relaxed and easy going, okay? So we all say a prayer with me? Dear Jesus, we love you. And we love your saying, Peace, be still. Remember when it's tough. That you are with us always. Amen. Okay, now. Let us pray. Lord God, help us turn our hearts to you and hear what you will speak. For you speak peace to your people. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson today is the 29th Psalm. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders, the Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all say glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Our Old Testament reading for today.
Our worship follows a series entitled Following Jesus. We're reading stories of Jesus and following him through those stories. And uh, as we do, I pray, learning more about those, including us, who would follow Jesus, what that means, what that entails, what is uh, demanded of us or what it involves for us to pattern our lives after the one who goes before us and leads us in the way of the rule of God in our world, following Jesus. Our gospel lesson today comes from the fourth chapter of the gospel according to Mark. As Danny has already uh, shared with the children, it is the story of a trip that Jesus makes with his disciples and what it is that they learn in the midst of a storm. Hear the word of God. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The grass withers, the flower fades. The word of our God will stand forever. It starts with obedience. Jesus gives a command and the disciples obey. Jesus says, let us go across to the other side and they follow Jesus in his desire to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. It is evening, and on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. That day, we find out from the beginning of the fourth chapter of Mark's gospel, that day has been a day of Jesus' teaching all the way through the day. He's been in a boat on the side of the banks of the Sea of Galilee, on his side, their side, the, the familiar side where, where his land is and where those fishermen are who become his disciples. And a crowd's gathering to hear Jesus speak, and, and it seems like the best option in that setting for him to get into one of the boats there and to sit down and teach from the boat. Everyone can see him, everyone can hear him, and he can teach. And so he does, and he teaches all day. I can presume that he is tired from that. I know what it's like when on a Sunday I'm, I'm teaching two or three hours, and I'm played out by the end. Um, and I know what you're thinking, you don't go there at all, please. However tired you are from listening, uh, I know how tired I am from speaking. And Jesus was speaking all day until evening. It's the natural time in which it would be uh, appropriate and expected to kind of shut down the shop and people go back to their homes. Jesus and his disciples take their needed rest from that day of ministry 
and concern and concentration and proclamation. And yet what Jesus says at that time unexpectedly is let us go across to the other side, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. They start a boat trip at night across to the Sea of Galilee. The setting time-wise is important to me because it's not just that Jesus is at the end of a long day of ministry. It's that he is proposing to go to this place that we talked about last Sunday, the land of the Gerasenes, on the far side of the Sea of Galilee, some miles away is that land where people do not know this good news yet. They have not heard recently of the kingdom of God, and certainly not in Jesus' ministry has there been his proclamation, his revelation of this good news. We know from the story that we considered last week that Jesus is headed over there and will encounter a man possessed of a legion of demons. And that in that encounter, Jesus will confront the man and restore him, transform him from demonized to humanized. He will... will banish the demons from this man. He will resume rule over this land and over the territory that God has in this person who has been possessed by a rival spirit. And this day, in today's story, at evening time, after a full day's work, Jesus proposes to go over there for that man. It's a mission trip. And Jesus' disciples obey Jesus' command. He says, let us go. And they follow him. Better, really, they transport him themselves. He's in the boat. They just take that boat and head on out. That's how the narration tells it, right? Leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. No exit, no curtain coming down, just wave goodbye and the shore (laughs) gets farther and farther away. The disciples are working and Jesus, I presume, very quickly is, is snoozing. And then comes a storm. The storm wouldn't be anything unexpected, truly. The Sea of Galilee is notorious for quick squalls that rise up uh, unexpectedly. And the uh, disciples, right, there's a, a number of them who are fishermen. So they know how boats work and they know how this uh, body of water works. That's their home turf. Well, not turf. Their home water. It's not unfamiliar to them. And yet there's something about this storm, apparently, that is uh, more notable than others. Sometimes sailors have that sense. And you get a, uh, a story here in which, in which uh, very quickly it gets perilous. And the, the wonderful image that we have from the story it is an eyewitness story it must have been that Peter told Mark this and Mark wrote it down this way is that while the disciples are straining at the oars alarmed by the water that's coming over the gunnels of the boat and and perhaps just bailing as fast as it comes in they're wondering why it is that Jesus isn't bailing with them or rowing He's not even awake, (laughs) and they are perturbed. Teacher, they say, do you not care that we are perishing? The terror is in their voices. It's rising up into their mouths, and it's coming out 
it's very much a life and death situation from their perspective. And it's telling, isn't it, that their language with Jesus is so earnest. Do you not care that we are perishing? There's an interesting contrast if you read the story and uh, look at it again. It's a brief story, right? It's just six verses. It's maybe ten sentences. And in all of this story, the action bodily is done by, by the disciples. They're the ones straining at the oars. They're the ones, I presume, bailing out the water. They're the ones flurring about and scurrying. And Jesus sleeps, and then he wakes up, and then he speaks. That's it. At the beginning of the story, Jesus says, let's go across to the other side. And then he sleeps. And when he wakes up, same man, same voice, says to the storm, peace, be still. And like the performative utterance of God at the creation, who said, let there be light, and it got bright. Or, let there be water. And it was so. When Jesus said, peace, be still, it became calm. I like how the translation that we read here says, the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. A dead calm. Dead. They were thinking that there's something going to be dead here. They thought it was themselves who would be dead here. And that concern wells up from within them and, and betrays their lack of faith. And Jesus calls them on it. Because they have said to Jesus, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And there are two things in there about Jesus that are, in essence, they're accusing him. One is that we are perishing and you're not doing anything about it. Two, you don't care about this situation or hence about us. Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Jesus' words, I think, address not only the storm without, but also the storm within. Peace, says Jesus. Be still. And there was a dead calm into which Jesus asks this question. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? They have not trusted that Jesus with whom they sail is, is one who is who he truly is. They've not perceived that. And so they have not trusted him to be able to do anything in this situation. And they've not trusted him even to be the kind of teacher who actually cares about the people whom he leads. And Jesus' gentle rebuke names the crisis in the hearts of those who follow him. It is a crisis of a lack of perception and a lack of trust. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? It's a great story, I believe, because it's, it's what happens on a mission trip. It's what happens when followers of Jesus 
obey Jesus and find themselves in their obedience in the kind of pickle or better crisis that truly threatens their existence. And the question is, if that happens, what do we think about God in this picture? Do we think that Jesus is inviting his followers into a time of devastation and failure? Or do we trust that in Jesus, God is reaching out to deepen our faith and to teach us about the power that truly does save us? It's a life and death kind of situation. It's not just that there's a bad storm and there's um, the threat of drowning. It is all of that plus for this audience that would have heard this, schooled in the faith of scriptures, they would have heard and understood the, the, the deep, deep threat of disintegration and, and the lack of, of God's presence in the world. Every time scripture uses the image of the sea, it carries the echo of the first chapter of Genesis. You remember how it goes that the very beginning, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was a formless void. And the Spirit of God moved over the face of the deep. The image is of uncreated chaos, disordered, disintegrated. And the Spirit of God moves over that chaos and brings forth order and, and, and life, our being, out of that which is nothing. And the story of the creation is really a kind of a beautiful thing because what happens is progressively as God's Spirit works in this process, there's ground for us to stand on. And the waters that symbolize that threat of chaos are pushed aside. And they're put in their places. Even the waters that are pictured to be above the earth are, are protected from devastating us by this firmament that keeps them where they belong. Story of the creation. Israel came back to it again and again and again in the Psalms when the lament or the prayer is as of the, the, the danger of some crisis that we're in that's going to destroy us. That's the threat, that we will be destroyed and that God, in God's rule with us, will be rendered impotent or meaningless or non-existent. It's the entire enterprise that's at risk in this little boat on the Sea of Galilee. That's how it feels when we're in crisis. It's not just I'm in danger, it's that everything is at risk and it feels as if the entire universe is crumbling. Remember, back to those national crises that we can recall how it felt that the ground was shaky beneath our feet. Remember how it feels when you go through one of those, what do we call them? Existential crises that makes us wonder what our entire lives have meant whether we will survive and whether the order that we've always trusted actually is true. This is a story that takes the church of Jesus Christ, takes the followers of Jesus 
into and through that experience and affirms that the one whom we follow does care and is powerful to save. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And Jesus says, peace, be still. I find it interesting that when the story tells us of the disciples' fear, it's not until this point. I mean, we gather that they're uh, energized and attentive during the midst of the storm, but after the calm, when Jesus says, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they realize that the one who is addressing them and calling them to deeper faith is the one who has power over the wind and the waves. They know that the human being in the back of the boat has the power of the creator of the universe. They know in a moment who it is who addresses them. Mark tells us at that point, verse 41, they were filled with great awe. In the original language, it reads something like this. They were afraid with a fearsome fear. You can't underline enough that the fear comes after the realization that our safety, our security, are in the hands of this one who's invited us to follow him. The story begins with obedience, the disciples' obedience to Jesus' Invitation, let us go across the other side. It ends with their question Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Their realization is that even in the midst of a storm, the followers of Jesus can discover who Jesus truly is. And who it is whose love holds them. Two stories to tell you to end this sermon. Both of them are conversations this week with followers of Jesus in the midst of a storm. One is with a sister in faith who has been paddling for a long time across the sea in a storm. And she has been bailing water and still faithful in pulling the oars. And yet, even after suffering great loss and withstanding continuing headwinds, she says to me, Gordon, you know, as hard as all of this has been, God has been giving me something very beautiful. A great gift. And I wouldn't know to expect it. But here it is. And a couple of days ago I spoke with a younger member of our church who's experienced the devastation of the sudden and tragic loss of a comrade of his I said how you doing man and he tells me oh it's been the hardest time in my life but you know Gordon he says I've never felt closer to God he's come very close to me in this time This story does not promise us that Jesus will protect us from harm. It 
promises us and reminds us that in the midst of the storm, there is a greater power that loves us and holds us forever. What did you sing earlier this morning? When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Friends, as people offered peace through our faith in Jesus Christ, so let us all now stand and affirm what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. <coughs> Christian, what do you believe? I believe, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let's pray. Dear loving, loving Lord, no matter where we are in our lives, Lord, no matter where we're headed, or no matter what we're doing, we are confident that we find our help and our peace in and through you. Lord, you are the creator and the sustainer of all that has been made and all that will ever be made. And yet the immensity of creation does not distract you, Lord, from caring personally for each and every one of us. Lord, you do not daydream or become weary in that care. We thank you, Lord, that you not only watch over us with diligence, but you, you promise to guide us so that we won't fall or stumble as we face the challenges that you set before us or that life gives to us. Lord, whether we are awake or asleep, you are there. You're sheltering and protecting us from all that would harm us. And Lord, we know that you watch over all of our living. You have in the past we are confident that you are now. Your promise, Lord, holds us for the future and for all of eternity. And we praise and thank you for that reality that calms and comforts us. And Lord, we thank you for the call that you give us in our lives, for that command to go and to be your light and your angels and ambassadors of change in this world. Lord, let us respond with joy give us the confidence you'll give us all we need to be equipped to do that great task and lord let us trust in you that you will make that task something that pleases you and glorifies your great name as we share your love with the world lord today as we gather as the body of christ we hold up names of those whom we love church family members and members of our immediate families and friends and co-workers who've gone through challenges and who need your peace in their lives. Today, hear our prayers for Bette Britt as she recently completed her cancer surgery and after good news, after test results. Hear our prayers for Ron Jacobs, who's at National Health Care after a recent fall, as well as Jean Baden as she goes through her time of rehab. We lift up to you Leslie Grinnell, June's daughter, who's battling cancer, as well as Alan Hopkins, who has health concerns, and Dick Powers. We pray for Margaret Redmond after her knee replacement surgery, and for Jean Richters and her family as Jean is under hospice care. We 
pray for Janet Sadler, who's recovering well after knee replacement surgery, as well as Vern Skumaltz, who's battling cancer. Here are prayers for our sister Mary Stahl, who's recovering from health issues, as well as Helen Stone. Lord, we pray for Chuck Sadler, the nephew of Janet and Bob, who has serious health concerns. We pray for Barbara Trammell's dear friend, Mary Daniel, who's been in intensive care but is now home battling health issues. We pray for Dot Child's son, Tim Taylor, who's diagnosed with cancer, and for Sandy Forrest, dear friends, going through health concerns, for Joel Olson, for Jerry Green and Terry Newman. We pray for Jennifer Riddell's mother, Janice James, and we pray for Kelly Weeks' sister, Ashley Gill. Here are prayers for Wendy Cress's niece, Sarah Owens, for Julie and Danny Schaff's dear neighbor, Ruth Gardner, who's battling cancer, for Heather Pratt's friend, Ron Stadt, and also for Betsy Turnbull's brother, Bob Thomas, who's fighting that terrible disease. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your love for all of us. Thank you for your calming presence, a presence that we know can never be taken away from us. And Lord, let us all gather as one as we say the prayer that you taught to all of your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as the ushers come forward, let us remember the words from Jesus himself who said it is more blessed for us to give than to receive.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Lord, accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever in the name of Christ, our Savior and Protector. Amen. So let us go hand in hand with the one who calls us to follow. And let us trust that that hand will hold us when the waters threaten to overtake us. And let us encourage one another that, that we can uh, give strength and blessing to all who need to know that we're in the grip of a loving, saving God. As we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be ours now and always.